uh, Antonio Grigic. I hope I uh, pronounce this uh, well. Uh, again, an uh, uh, architect, uh, uh, if I'm right, uh, affiliated to the uh, Technische Universität Graz, uh, where he's a free researcher making his uh, PhD, if I'm uh, well, if I'm uh, well informed. Uh, and he will talk. Um, um, <coughs> Sorry, uh, sorry about this. Um, yeah, he will talk about the peculiar case of the monument in honor of the Viceroy uh, Josip Dilacic at the central square of Zagreb, uh, between forgetting and memory, between national identity and communist ideology, between feminism and patriarchy. Uh, the title itself uh, uh, shows already how, uh, in how, uh, how, um, uh, how fascinating and uh, in how many uh domains uh, this uh, this talk will, will bring us uh, about this uh, statue of of uh, josip jelacic that uh, some of us or or that has gained also an international renown uh, recently i guess with uh, after the um, um after the theatrical uh, suicide of of slobodan um <clears throat> who uh, was uh, in the the um, after his um, after, uh, in, in the, the um, international uh, Yugoslavia tribu tribunal, um, after which uh, the, the Praljak was was um, uh, honored as a as a hero uh, next to this uh, to this statue of of Josip uh, gave again I think uh, uh, this aspect of of um, resurrection of rebirth uh, to this statue but uh, i give the floor to uh, to antonio now to talk about about the statue and its uh, resurrection thank you for the introduction it was thank you very much it was uh, all correctly said uh, yes the, the the notion of resurrection is very important because uh, ban jelacic visro jelacic in croatian uh, there is a popular song uh, which was forbidden during the communism it is said it have some christological notion inside you know so for the ban Yelachich, he has to be resurrected and to save croatia this is the song about his resurrection and you know like a christ he will come again and and save croatia so this notion of resurrection is very important uh for this uh, for this uh monument so to start uh the monument to Vistroy Josip Jelacic in the form of the horseman on a stallion with a highly raised sword was erected in 1866. It was the first political monument in Zagreb and the square itself was also named after the Vistroy Josip Jelacic. At that time, Zagreb was a small provincial town of the Habsburg monarchy with a population of 20,000. But its political importance went beyond its modest demographic and economic Capacity. Zagreb was the Croatian national capital, so it was nationalistic center of Croatia. But also, together with the Prague, Zagreb was the center of all Slavism and Austro Slavism in what was territorially and ethnic ethnically vast Habsburg Empire. Zagreb was also the cultural and political center for the realization of the Yugoslav idea of gathering all of the southern Slavs beyond the borders of existing monarchy. So there was uh, for a small city, there were so many political different uh, platforms for the political future of the Croatia and for the Zagreb. Uh, the monuments to the Viceroy was placed on the main square of Zagreb, making the square the political and symbolic center of Croatia. Uh, the Viceroy played an important role in overcoming the revolutionary movements in the Habsburg Empire in 1848. But at the same time, he sought to realize Croatian national interest, thus becoming the most important Croatian national hero of its age. Karl Marx, as his contemporary, wrote extremely negatively about him on several occasions because of its role in quelling the revolution in Vienna and, and, and Hungary. For that reason, when the communists came to power in Yugoslavia and Croatia in 1945, an interesting paradox took place on the Viceroy Josip Jelic Square. The coexistence of the communist ideology based on the writings of the Karl Marx with the monument dedicated to the Viceroy Josip Jelacic, who was marked by Marx as a symbol of political reaction. 
Socialist rallies parades with images of communist leaders were organized under the feet of the monument, but it soon became clear the pictorial representation of the Marx and the Josip Jelacic in the same square was ideologically undesirable. There was no room for both of them in the square. That was one of the reasons why the monuments to the Visroy was covered and hidden from the view with the different social realist architecture construction soon after the communist takeover of power in May of 1945. One of the first construction covering the monument to the Visroy Josip Jelacic was dedicated to the session of the anti-fascist Women's Front of Croatia. In 1945, women in communist Yugoslavia were allowed to vote for the first time. This construction was built in the shape of the two giant women, a female warrior on one side and the farmer on the other. In a way, monument to patriarchal power in the form of the horseman on a stallion with a highly raised sword was covered with the representation of the women political emancipation. After two years of Kosvilland, under different socialist realist architecture constructions, the monument to the Viceroy was secretly completely removed from the square in 1947. The name of the square was also changed and the singing of popular song about his resurrection and the saving of creation uh, was banned in an attempt to erase every material and verbal trace of the memory of the monument and the Viceroy himself. In order to reduce the dissatisfaction of Croats produced by the removal of that political military national symbol, another monument was erected in Zagreb as an, an act of compensation, monument to the Croatian king Tomislav. Tomislav was king of the Croatian kingdom in the 10th century. He united the kingdom and Cro Croats and military defeated the ex and expelled the Hungarians in their atten attempt to seize the northern territories of Croatia. The monument was already cast in bronze, in 1933, during the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, and the pedestal for the monuments was erected and covered with marble in 1945, during the fascist puppet independent state of Croatia. But the bronze equestrian monument itself was not placed on a pedestal. When the communists came to power in 1945, a five-pointed star was placed on the empty pedestal of the monument, which was replaced by the monument to King in 1947, the same year when the monument to Viceroy was removed from the central square of Zagreb. This was a game of political chess in which monuments were the main chess figures. This is the photo of the monument before the Second World War. But the chessboard stretched far beyond Zagreb streets and squares. It covered the entire territory of Yugoslavia. Monuments fell like chess pieces. They were altered or moved outside the chessboard altogether. Although the October Revolution was the model for the Yugoslav communists in carrying out their revolution, when they seized power in Yugoslavia, no decree was passed like one in Russia. The decree on the Republic's monuments in revolutionary Russia had an aim to launch a wave of demolition of monuments dedicated to the former regime. Without such document, in Yugoslavia, erasing a past by demolish, de demolishing the monuments was a decision made given to the specific of the local situation. But this practice of demolishing monuments was not a novel thing. It can be seen as a continuation of the tradition of demolishing monuments in the past, which was particularly strong in areas of Yugoslavia, which were part of the Holmstrom Hungarian Empire. In those territories, which comprise Slovenia, Croatia, Vojvodina, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, Geo geopolitical changes were frequent. With the demise of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and consequent entrance of these lands into the first Slavic country in 1918, monuments dedicated to the Habsburg emperors and their dignitaries were ritually destroyed in these lands. Sometimes monuments to the new kings of Karadžorjevic lineage were erected on the empty pedestals of monuments to the Austrian or Hungarian kings and emperors. This situation served as an illustration of the satirical talk of the legendary Stanislav Jerzilets, who advised when you demolish monuments, keep the pedestal because they can always be used again. Some 20 years ago, after, in 1941, with the fall of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia during the Second World War, these monuments of the last two Serbian kings were in these same areas also demolished by the occupiers or by the local population. This is the monument to the King of Alexander in Varaždin, Croatia, who was demolished in 41. 
Even without passing a similar top-level document as Lenin, Anatoly Lonacharsky, and Stalin did, the new Yugoslav government adopted the Bolshevik tactics described in the decree on Republic's monuments, issued by the Council of People's Commissars almost 30 years before. Along with the removal of monuments dedicated to Tsars and their service, the same form of mobilization of artists for the design of the monuments to celebrate the great days of the revolution started in 1945. Immediately after the taking, the levers of political power. As in Russia, in this case, a revolution took place in real time after the 1945. Temporary built monuments in urban centers were often part of scenography for the public spectacles. Stage propaganda cultural events were organized in central urban, urban squares with the aim of to consolidate the new communist government. But unlike during revolution in Russia, these mass spectacles were not using aesthetic of the Russian avant-garde but were using the style of the socialist realism, which was predominant in the USSR at the time. This stylistic choice was logical consequence of the geopolitical relation in post-Second World War Europe, where the USSR was the patron and elder brother of the newly born communist Yugoslavia. During these mass spectacles organized in Yugoslavia, a similar problem has occurred as did in revolutionary Russia almost three decades earlier, namely non-communist monuments that were not demolished were in a conflict with the messages conveyed by the new communist street art of the revolution. The tactic used in such cases is one that has been applied by the Kubist painter Nathan Altman, who was commissioned for the decoration of the palace square for the celebration of the first anniversary of the revolution in Petersburg in 1918. In the focal point of the palace stands the Alexander Column. It was erected in 1980. 34, after the Russian victory in the war with Napoleon, France, and it's named after the Emperor Alexander I of Russia. Nathan Altman's cubist design was an installation, temporary work of architectural sculpture at the base of this neoclassical piece of architecture, hiding the pedestal of the Alexander Column, which was decorated with symbols of military glory and of imperial times. New rostrum at the base of the existing column was hiding the imperial past, but was also illustrating new political and social order, where ordinary citizens could freely approach the monument with stairs. That was the essence of Altman's approach art to collective interaction as a major feature of the proletarian art. This is a sketch. A similar tactic of concealing all symbols with the temporary constructions were, was applied by the new Yugoslav communist government. As mentioned before, the most intriguing example of this tactics of concealment of the old monuments with the new art happened in Zagreb. Zagreb was the second largest city in Yugoslavia, and at the time, the capital of the federal state of Croatia, which would later become People's Republic of Croatia in federal Yugoslavia. The reason for intrigue is unique situation of coexistence of old acquaintances, Karl Marx and Visroy Josip Pielacic. Going deeper into the issue, confronting Karl Marx and Visroy is an interesting exercise on several levels. As already stated, they were contemporaries. Even more, Marx's capital was released one year after the erection of the monument to the Visroy Zagreb. Marx wrote many times with strong passion and with negative feelings about Josip Jelacic and his role in suppressing the revolution in Vienna in 1848. Their opposition clashes with the different political positions they have taken during the last time which is still evident today in the semantization as symbols of different policies of history. The controversy over reading Marx's chauvinistic statements about the Slavs, especially the Czech and the Croats, is additional elements in this intriguing story, because the square is central square of Zagreb, capital of Croatia. When the communists seized power in Yugoslavia and Zagreb in 1945, Karl Marx and Josip Jelacic suddenly found themselves in the same location in impossible cohabitation. The government changed the new name and get the new name of the square. It became Republic Square in 1946. The new government also organized a series of mass spectacles, spectacles on the Republic Square after the liberation. And the portrait of Karl Marx was a necessary part of the state designs of this public political theater. The cohabitation of the two representatives of the character of Karl Marx and Josip Jelacic was of course ideologically impossible and resulted in the removal of one of them. It was Visroy that was removed, of course, but the manner in which the monument was removed is interesting. 
First, the Viceroy Yelachich monument was covered and hidden from the view with a 14 meter tall wooden structure in 1845. The monument to the Vistroy in the form of a horseman on a stallion with a highly raised sword was a metaphor for patriarchy with a strong and explicit phallic connotation. That is why it is interesting that the woman is the first motive that was placed on the wooden construction with which the monument to the Vistroy Jelacic was hidden. It was done for the occasion of the first Congress of the Anti-Fascist Wo Women's Front of Croatia. Women were equal fighters during the Second World War in a partisan movement that promised gender emancipation. After Second World War and with the establishment of the new government, they were given the right to the vote in the elections. In this way, this new temporary monument in the Republic Square, together with living monuments in the form of the procession that took place around it, became a sign of a promise of emancipation, not only of women, but the, the whole society as such. The woman in public space was no longer the object of sublime religious or nationalistic veneration, but the political subject both in the war trenches as in the war process. On one side of the gigantic structure that covered the monument was a plaster relief of a colossal partisan woman with a rifle, and on the other, a peasant woman with a hay fork. This short-term and temporary break in the monopoly of the representation of the patriarchy in the main city square indicated the beginning of the political emancipation of women after the liberation of the country. Also, it indicated the new ways of involvement of women in political processes. It is important to note that both women who were portrayed were ordinary and anonymous representatives of the people, not separate personalities with their first and last name. This is where the collective aspect, aspect of communist utopia can be read. These women were giant dimensions, and when the square was full, they grew out of the gathered mass as an expression of the popular will, as in the painting of Boris Kustodiev, the Bolshevik from 1920. After the first Congress of Anti-Fascist Women Front of Croatia, celebrations of other political events also introduced new architecture that covered the monument to Vistroy Jelacic. On the occasion of the May 1st celebration, the edifice that covered the monument was in the form of the anvil as the symbol of the work, and on another occasion in the form of the electric power line tower. Temporary monuments in the service of the overlay of the old monument altered one after another until both of them covered constructions and monuments proper disappeared in 1947. Namely, the equestrian monuments to Ban Josip Jelacic was cut into the pieces and dismantled. And after two years of his, of his concealment, he disappeared from the square and gave his place to the contemporary Karl Marx Utopia, which took place in its central locus on ideological fantasy. The case of Zagreb's main square in, is the most interesting example of what was happening in other cities in Yugoslavia based on the Bolshevik tactics of revolutionary Russia. Of course, the situation in each city was different. The major difference between Yugoslavia and revolutionary Russia is that the style used in the set, in the set design. In Yugoslavia, it was socialist, realist style that was used, rather than the cubist like Nathan Altman or constructivist like Popov and Vesnina. Unless, of course, we consider this act of building itself a construction around all monument, a constructivist act by itself. The square was left empty without a monument for the next 43 years. Sometimes after the removal of the monument, temporary structures would be erected from the time to time, which would temporarily fit the gap left by the removed monument. For example, giant New Year trees or the New Year decoration in a form of giant sculpture or a temporary metal upright structure was erected and served as an advertisement for the Zagreb fair with the flags of the countries participating in the fair. In this example, instead of the national monuments of the Viceroy, we got international monuments to the economic power that was the only substitute and consolation for the loss of any political or military power within the new political formation of which Zagreb and Croatia became part. 
This lasted until the fall of communism in 1919, when the square was renamed the Visroy Josip Jelacic Square again, and the monument was re-erected on the square with the organized mass event with the laser show, which was covered by the live television broadcast. It was a symbolic act of creating the illusion of the end of the history and setting the ideological conflicts in the newly form, formed ideology that claimed that there was not ideology at all and that we have reached the post-ideological society. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, very fascinating once more, uh, the, this, this entire history of this, uh, of this statue uh, through the ages is uh, really fascinating. Maybe I, I, I would maybe like to ask a question whether uh, um, under the during Second World War itself, the, during the Ustashar regime, independent state of Croatia, was there really a, a Yelacic cult? Had he been um, had he been uh, uh, yeah cultivated as a hero during um, during and had there been uh, for example commemorations or uh, for him uh, within the the, the Ustasha state? And also afterwards, uh, was um, could it uh, be that even after the Second World War, he remained somehow a, or his statue, I mean, remained a kind of um, um, focus for, or, um, or an object, let's say, for, um, yeah, uh, Ustasha commemorations? Uh, well, uh, this second, Thank you for a question. Uh, the second question is no, because he was not really um, connected with the Ustasha regime. Ustasha regime also uh, tried the all national symbols, including the Visroy Bani Elacic, to include into its narrative. But he was not like a centerpiece of the, of the narrative. So after the Second World War, he was not used uh, mainly uh, uh, as a uh, as a Ustasha propaganda because it was just one part, but it was a symbol of, of a communist repression of the Croatian na uh, nation. So it was a symbol, but it was not like a centerpiece of the Ustasha uh, Ustasha uh, uh, Ustasha emotion and and a revision. The 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 centerpiece of this uh, uh, of this uh, mythology after the Second World War was in Bleiburg. We probably know you are very informed in Austria, where the Ustasha uh, army uh, surrendered to the British, and the British army uh, uh, put them in, under the control of the Yugoslav army, which uh, killed something about uh, fifty thousand to the eighty thousand. It's not the number is not clear of the Ustasha. So this was the centerpiece of the uh, uh, resentment of the Ustasha regime. So. It was used as a as a as a as a symbol, but not so much. Uh, and during the Second World War, so uh, the Ustasha, there was not some big uh, uh, some big uh, celebration uh, in Banja Lačić, but Ustasha made some other thing. They made another monument near the near the uh, near the um, uh, Banja Lačić monument. I show it now. So it was the to the victims of the. Uh, to the victims of the uh, Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslav unification, when the Croatia became part of Yugoslavia, there was demonstrations against this, and then there was a people who were shot in the by the by the Yugoslav army in uh, 1918. So the the Ustasha made um, made uh, uh, made a new monument, which was like a main monument for them in a in a. Uh, in a, in 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 a, in a, this square, you, you can see. So there is this in the first row. There is a, this Ustasha monument, which was uh, built uh, near the the Ban Yelacic square. So this was the centerpiece. This was because the uh, because the Ban Yelacic was not for, for uh, fighting against the Serbs. So the main sentiment of the Ustasha regime is hatred of the toward the Serbs. So and uh, the uh, the Ban Yelacic was not. Um, fighting against the Serb, he was not anti-Serb, 
not just that, he was when he became the viceroy, uh, he was uh, crowned. Let's let's be said in the church by the Orthodox Serbian Orthodox priest because the uh, the Bishop of Zagreb was not at the time in Zagreb, but also when he fought against Hungarians for the Vojvodina, which is now north of the Serbia, but then Vojvodina was part of Austria Hungary. He was calling the Vojvodina Serbian, so he was fighting for the Croatian uh, interest, but also for the Serbian Vojvodina. So the Vojvodina would become the part of Serbia. So he he was not a uh, anti-Serb, and for the Ustasha uh, ideology, which was mainly anti-Serbian. Uh, he was not a very important uh, person. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Other questions? Someone? Yes, Bruno. Uh, what, what what was the purpose of uh, not not uh, immediately destroying the monument after the Second World War? Why did they cover it up for a? Uh, for some time and, and later uh, removed it. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Bruno. Uh, well, we can only speculate. My speculation is because, you know, when the uh, uh, partisan uh, movement take over the Croatia and the Zagreb, um, there was, you know, uh, for a small period of time, of four years, there was independent state of Croatia, which was like a puppet state of the Hitler, and but it was a Croatian state. So many people at the beginning believed that it was, you know, Croatian dream to have a state. So uh, it was a national symbol. After, after two weeks, it, it, it was obvious it is it was not the state. It it it, it was a fascist puppet state without any uh, prerogatives of a state. So the mainly Croatians went to the partisan movement. So like, there was hundreds of thousands of partisans from Croatia coming, fighting against this state. But so after the U Yugoslavia uh, started to, to be modeled again, it was important not to destroy uh, national symbols and uh, Croatian, because you, let's say, you destroy the independent state of Croatia. It was not independent, it was not a state, but it was called independent state of Croatia. So. You cannot, you know, try to distract all the symbols of, of the nation. And uh, Banjelacic, we didn't have uh, in Croatia, let's say, for the last 500 years, many heroes. Banjelacic was one of them. And so it was very important not to destroy it uh, at once. So there was this magical, you know, trick. They made these constructions around it. And then at one point, two years, you know, after two years, people starting to not remember that under this this construction there was something else and then after this two years the construction but also the monuments you know like in a magician head it disappeared so i think it was it was it was done you know as a as a as a let's make temporary movement from the destruction of the monuments but not to done it uh, immediately because the you know in zagreb people and in Croatia, the Bani Elacic was a national hero. It will be seen, you know, and as an anti-Croatian, uh, anti-Croatian stance. So the the communists were really uh, trying to be, uh, 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 let's say, uh, to go on the toes with destroy because there was not a really reason for destruction of these monuments. It was done by, as we know, by Mika Špiljak. He was a Croatian, and he was uh, he ordered it and uh, he was Croatian communist. So it was really a strange decision because in, 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 in Belgrade, in a central Belgrade, there is a Knez Mihailo, also monuments on a equestrian monument with a, uh, with a horse and everything, but it was not distracted. So uh, the reason why Ban Jelacic was distracted and uh, this in Belgrade was, let's say that the Ban Jelacic was a servant to the uh, foreign emperor to the Habsburg emperor so this is the reason why we this destroy we are destroying him and not the, the 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 same king let's say in serbia who was who was like king of a national blood of serb blood so this was the, the distinction but really it, it is a strange decision because um it, it, they destroyed this other uh, fascist uh, fascist monument which was built in a, in a, in a uh, in the same square so 
a reason for destruction of this monument it really it was really strange. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.